You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, friends. I'm Melissa. And I'm Alicia. And we're the hosts of Love Letters 2, the podcast that brings you two times a week love letters to the people, places, and events in history that should be celebrated and remembered. You are now about to enter into the realm of the Queen's Podcast with our friends Katie and Nathan. If you are sensitive to strong language, this is your heads up. You are most certainly going to hear it within this episode. Hi, this is Katie. And this is Nathan. And you're listening to Queen's Podcast, the show about badass women in history. Showtime. It's showtime. Da, 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 da. So, Nathan. Who are we talking about today? Adam de Montespan. Oh, yes! I love. I'm kind of I ca- excited. I love how you like you said it like Montespan. Like you put some like you I put know. some sexy in it. Like you. Yeah, but uh, disclaimer: we're probably gonna say all of these names wrong. Oh God, <laughs> there's so I. And the thing is, we really do, y'all. We. We really do try to go find how to pronounce some of these names, and um, sometimes it's just not going to happen as hard nope. as we try. Um, nope. So the French names we have attempted to learn how to say, if we get them wrong, and you still feel the need to go into our reviews and give us a bad review for that, well, you know, it sounds like your life is sad. Oh, I love it. I love <laughs> Sassy Katie. I love Sassy Katie. This is well, great. I've, I, I've already had one of your cocktails, so Ooh. maybe that's why I'm a little sassy. So, Nathan, what are we drinking? So, this is called the French Martini. Ooh. So, what I did is I took an ounce and a half of raspberry vodka half an ounce of Chambord, which, um, fun fact, Mm -hmm. Louis XIV of France was one of the first people to sample Chambord. Which is very relevant to the content we are about to discuss. I know. I love it. I I know he wasn't like the first one because they they probably wanted to make sure it wasn't going to kill anybody first. (laughs) You might want to make sure it doesn't kill anybody before you give it to the king. That tracks. Yeah. 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 But he was one of the first to really taste it. So, Half an ounce of that. Then I took two ounces of cranberry juice. Okay. And then a half an ounce of blackberry liqueur. Mm. And then I mix that all together, strain into a glass, and throw some blackberries on that hoe. Yes. Oh! (laughs) So today we've only got one Patreon shout out, Caroline. Sweet Sweet Caroline. Caroline. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure she doesn't get that at all, ever. Uh, no, never, never. I'm sure never she's never that got one. that before. Well, <laughs> Caroline, thank you for supporting us on Patreon, and thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon, as well as just anybody that likes our show and listens and yeah. follows us on social media. And, and uh, yeah, thanks, everybody. <laughs> so, let's start off with Miss Madame de Montespan. Oh, there you go. There you go. All right, right. Uh, so our girl was born on October 5th, 1640 in France. Yes. Uh, we actually know her birthday, so yeah, yay. She's a Libra. Yes, so according to Yield Google, uh, Librans are extroverted, cozy, and friendly people. Librans like the scales that they symbolize the sign are often concerned with attaining balance, harmony, peace, and justice in the world. With their vast stores of charm, intelligence, frankness, persuasion, and seamless connectivity, they are well equipped to do so. So that last sentence, I feel like chef's kiss for our girl. I think a lot of that really tracks, yeah. Her full name at birth was Francois Atinus. De Rocher de Montemarte. Nailed, Nailed it. it. Oh my gosh. I feel like I'm in Paris right now. <laughs> but I think, why don't we just call her Francois or Franny or later Montespan? Like she's or kind of known madam as. Madam, if you're nasty. Oh, Miss Madam, if you're nasty. I love that. I love that. 
a big chunk of her life, she did go by her middle name, Atenas, which is like, um, if you see it written down, it looks like Athena. And that's because there was like, during her lifetime, there was this big um, surge in popularity of like Greek and Roman mythology. And so if her middle name's oh. Athena, it's after the goddess of, what was Athena the goddess of? War? Or something? Everything. 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 Yeah. And so that's why she adopted her middle name later in life because it was very trendy. But I sound like an asshole trying to say her middle name. So we're going to stick with <laughs> some of her other names. So her family life, bougie as hell. So mm-hmm. both mom and dad from very rich, influential families. But dad's family, the house of Rashuar, was next level bougie like next next level like bougie on bougie on bougie on bougie how many bougies was that for oh yes yes that's a lot that's a lot that's a how do you is that how you say four (laughs) (laughs) so like they're seriously noted in historical records from all the way up into like the ninth century so Mm -hmm. that's a big fucking deal that's an old ass family yeah and amongst this this group of nobilities like being able to trace your family as far back as 876 that was a flex that was a yeah. big flex. Yeah. So her dad was a duke and her mom was a lady in waiting to the current queen, Anne of Austria. So our girl knew life at court from a pretty young age. So mm-hmm. straight out the gate, she knew all the etiquette. She knew who everyone was, probably knew all the hot little gossip, all the tea that's being spilt everywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, not a bad start. And at all. And we know that she had an older sister, Gabriel. Gabrielle, sorry. Gabriel's my dog's name. Um, <laughs> Gabri- Gabriel. <laughs> I can't I can't talk today. Uh, she was a lady in waiting at court and was also very pretty and very popular. That's pretty unpopular in French. Just you're trying. Know. You're trying to lean in. Her dad was really popular at court. So everyone in this family had... Like, it was almost sort of like a trait you get, like, on my mom's side of the family, most of us are blonde. But in this family, it was like a trait that everybody got that they were funny and smart and witty. I love this. Yeah, me too. (sighs) So her dad was really, really popular at court because he had that family trait of being funny and smart and witty and just everyone liked being around it, around him. And Franny seems to have really um, inherited that trait from her dad. I love that he's the guy at the party that's like the life of the party. So yeah, they were known guy. for they were known for their very distinct sense of humor. And Franny would carry on that family tradition. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm sorry to bring some Hank Williams Jr. in here. <laughs> oh my god! Why do you drink? Yeah. <laughs> So the first 10 years of her life, we really don't know a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, We do know that mom and dad weren't really around, which is not too, too uncommon for some of the women that we covered, Mm -hmm. uh, because she would have been primarily raised by a nanny. So she'd get visits from her parents every now and then. It just wasn't like a regular occurrence. One thing I did read, though, is that her mom was worried that her daughters because i think they just had girls but she was worried that her daughters wouldn't feel attachment so her mom did go out of her way to visit home or write home as much as possible so that's that's nice nice. yeah (laughs) yeah Yeah, at least she wasn't completely abandoned yeah Uh, (laughs) sometimes she would actually go to court with her mom so However, the king of France, Louis the 13th, ended up dying in 1643. So Franny would have been about three at the time. Right. So her mother went from being lady in waiting to like basically being the queen. Yeah. But now, like, but now it's the dowager queen. Uh, yes. However, Anne of Austria, I think would be an interesting episode to do one day as well. Louis the 14th. Uh, mom Anne of Austria she was very very powerful in the early years of her son's reign so 
So even though yeah. her her boss has now gone from queen to dowager queen, she was still um, very much in the inner circles. I think we covered that in the Yadviga episode where like mom was stage mom and yeah. still had a lot of power. Well, I mean, look at Catherine strings. de' Medici, if we're talking mm-hmm. about dowager queen still being very powerful. So yeah. So little side note about what's going on in France in 1643. Uh, <laughs> and in 1643... The new king is crowned Louis the Fourteenth. Yes. Problem is, he's all of five years old. Hashtag babies don't need jobs. This no. is it. This is that is, in my personal opinion, you know, like we wouldn't elect a five year old to be president. Like I kind of feel like kings should probably follow the same. But he's actually one of the few baby kings. That is not a complete dumpster fire. His his childhood was insane. Maybe we can talk about it on Patreon at some point. But um, yeah, he did grow up to be, I think in his childhood, he learned really quick, like what not to do. Because mm-hmm. he had a lot of advisors doing some shifty shit. And so <laughs> he applied it to what not to do once he came into power. Yeah. Yeah, and fun fact, Louis the Fourteenth ruled for 72 years. 72 so, years! Yeah. So, Elizabeth II, still, you need to hold on, girl. Just a Two little bit years. longer. Two more yeah. years. Because right now, Louis the Fourteenth still holds the longest reigning monarch, right? Yes. And Elizabeth is two years behind, so come on, girl, keep on trucking. <laughs> she didn't start when she was five, so... He's got yeah, a little bit of a leg like, up. <laughs> got a little bit of a leg up on that one. Also, there is a ton of war during this story. Um, like nine, to be exact. Yes. Uh, and if you haven't watched or listened to Queen's podcast, because you don't watch a podcast, you listen to them. You listen, to, um, typically. Yeah. Um, we don't really talk that much about war because I think both of us have agreed that we kind of oh. kind of boring. <laughs> like, just not my jam. All the wars that went on during uh, Louis' reign, you can find podcasts on it. Like, you can find YouTube videos on them. Madame de Montespan, I found only one or two other podcasts that have dedicated episodes to her in all of the internet. And then, like, so we're not going to go into the war because if you are actually interested in the wars you can go find some other sources for that. We want to focus yes. on Madame. So uh, back to her story. Bring Let's back. F- fast forward. <laughs> and she's going to be about 12 years old. So it's time to focus on that education. I don't uh, like, I couldn't really tell if she got any education up to that point. Like, cause 12 seems kind of late in the game to start educating but I, I i have to assume she could at least read or something by that point yeah she'd probably know the basics of like reading writing music yeah. you know yeah. stuff like that 12 it was time to get serious and so she went off to a convent in our minds we maybe think like convent like dreary ugh. but like this was top-notch education for a girl at this time it would have been like a practical education, but as as mm. well as like a deep religious education. I read that she was very devout to the end of her life, saying that she took communion at least once a week. And I is I don't is that a lot? Is that a lot to take communion? I, th- I feel like that's pretty average because I know in Catholicism you do have to um, go to confession before you take communion. Okay. So if you haven't confessed your sins, you can't partake in communion. So that would mean not only is she going to confessions once a week, she's doing mm. communion once a week. So she's probably pretty active in the church. Okay. 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 One thing that I thought was kind of cool that she learned in the convent is that it wasn't typical for women of the nobility at the time is she learned to cook and she really enjoyed it. And like, oh, we nice. don't hear about that. We don't hear about that because she's going to have, She's not going to be cooking in her day to day. They're assuming she's going to marry a duke or something like that. She's yeah. not going to be cooking in her day to day. So I kind of love. I love you. Love cooking. I love cooking. I love cooking. Yeah, it's it's like a stress relief for me. Oh my god, it's like an art form. Yeah, and then at the end of it, you get to enjoy this tasty and delicious meal. I literally just ate my red beans and rice that I yes. Made. 
Even though for me, I, by the time I'm done cooking, I'm usually full because I taste it the whole time. Mm-hmm. No, that's the beauty of being a cook is you end up going to the table and serving everybody else and you look like you only eat two bites and you're like, mm, I'm like oh, full. I'm so dainty. I couldn't possibly eat more. It's because I've been eating for the last hour cooking this for you. But no, <laughs> like you don't hear that a lot with women of the nobility, that that was something they learned. So mm-hmm. that's just a funny little tidbit into her personality that I like. So her family was relatively happy and pretty close for that time um i mean her dad had lots of affairs but we all know frenchmen that's just Ugh. kind of the thing it was they just typical do back like back then it seemed like you could you could have all the affairs you wanted so long as you were still nice to your wife that was kind of yes. the rule so long as you're still nice to your wife whatever and mom didn't like that he had affairs which i'm sure not very many many women are like yeah this is fine uh she just never outright came and made a fuss about it because he so, was still nice never, to her most of the time. Right. Yeah. Plus, we don't really think they were really allowed each other all that much. So it wasn't like in her face, you know? Like, Yeah, not- she was working at the court of the queen. He was working somewhere else. So it's not like she saw his mistresses mm-hmm. often or whatever. But then Franny's dad falls in love hard with one of his mistresses. And yeah. I did go in a little bit of a rabbit hole about this because it was so weird like not weird but it was so unusual the circumstances um his wife is a stone cold hottie everyone is just like she's one of the most beautiful women at court got the girl that franny's dad just falls head over heels in, um is is older than his wife and not not a beauty but huh. w- whatever it was he just he was like this is my person i am done and he didn't want to hide this affair and he didn't want to Ugh. live a double life, which was like, the st- you could have a mistress, but you had to still show your wife, your wife be the person on your arm when you went somewhere. And he was like, no, I want this other woman that I actually love. And the entire court Ugh. was, the entire court was like, but she's not as pretty. She's not particularly rich. She's not. And he was just like, Mwah. This is what I'm doing. Oh, gosh. And he's just, like, doing it way out in the open. Mm -hmm. He's not hiding it at all. Mm -mm -mm. This is literally, like, he starts to live with her openly. Yes! Scandal. It was a huge scandal. And Mama was so embarrassed. She basically filed for, like, what we would uh, call today a legal separation. Because they couldn't get divorced. Uh, bitch is done. She's done. She's done. (laughs) But it's still, you know... It's, it's a little bit confusing to get into. That was not a done thing in the nobility at the time. You didn't divorce. You didn't separate from your husband. So it, yeah. feels, it feels like for a while there, her family life was tense. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so Franny was on her mother's side. So she was really close to her mom throughout all of this. Mm-hmm. Like, even though she grew up with her mom not around, she was always, like Katie was saying earlier, she would all, her mom would write to her all the time. Yeah. Right? So there was communication there. So, yeah, at this point in time, she takes mom's side publicly, which, I mean, it'd be kind of hard not to. Right. To, to defend somebody like this. Uh, but maybe she's also taken some notes on the side about dad. In the back of her head, and she's, she's like, like, hmm, hmm, how to survive a scandal. All right. So it is 1660. Our girl is 20 years old. She's educated as hell. She's bougie as hell. She's beautiful as hell. She's got long blonde hair, curvy figure, big blue eyes. I love how you you just basically described yourself. And she's funny as hell. <laughs> it at the french court killed it i would have definitely been a mistress of louis the 14th yes side note one thing a lot of people know about the reign of louis the 14th is that he lived at versailles Mm -hmm. well currently we're not there yet yes that's not this part of the story so Mm -mm. but right now the court is just genrely which is generally in french (laughs) thank um, you in paris (laughs) So in case you're wondering, like, geographically where this story is taking place at. She is given a job working for the king's brother's wife. A little bit of a side story here. Let's go on, like, le- okay. a si- what, side quest? What do they say in video games? Is this a side, side quest, quest, yes. We're going on a side quest. Good job, Katie. <laughs> yes. 
Because <laughs> uh, I, I really think this would be a really good Patreon subject. Mm. The king's brother was this guy named Philippe. And he was married to Henrietta of England. So remember Charles II that we've talked about in um, the Hortense Mancini and the Nell Gwynn episode? Yeah. So this is his sister. Okay. His his mother and his sister fled England when Charles I got his head cut off. As you might do when your dad gets his head cut off. <laughs> yeah, you, you might, might want Molly, you in danger, girl. You <laughs> might, yes. This was a <laughs> Molly, you in danger, girl. And so then they went to France. And so then she married <laughs> Philippe. But Philippe is gay as hell. Oh, yeah. No, I, I went down a rabbit hole on this one. Yeah, please Google an image of him. He just looks like he comes with fairy wings included. Batteries mm. included, too. Mm, yes, yes. But I was just thinking for a Patreon, it might be interesting to do an episode about him and the love of his life, his his main boyfriend. Yes. Anyway. That's going to happen. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. What you need to know about Madame de Montespan is that she is now working for Henrietta of England, the mm-hmm. sister-in-law to the king. And everyone fucking loves her. Like, she is a hit. Yeah, she's getting all this attention. Everyone loves her. She loves them for loving her. And that's showbiz kid. (laughs) That's that's showbiz kid. So Duke of Orleans thinks she is fucking hilarious. Oh, the Duke of Orleans is the... I don't think we said that yet. The Duke of Orleans is the Philippe guy. Philippe. Yeah. Yes, yes, the homoschmexual. The homoschmexual. <laughs> yes. Uh, so she's one of the Duchess's favorite ladies. She literally lights up the room anytime she joins a party. And then she meets a boy. Oh, of course she all does. All things are off. All, all bets are off now. Yep, yep. So his name was oh, Alexandra <laughs> de la Trimole. No, let me try. Alexandra de la Tremol. Yeah, whatever. Alexandra de la Tremol. Yes. (laughs) So, but he's from this really bougie family, too. And so they're, like, on the same level. Yeah, like, his name is impossible to say in an American accent without sounding like a total dickhead. So, sorry, we're just going to call him Alex. (laughs) (laughs) And he's like smart, funny, cute, charming. So it mm-hmm. sounds like they could be a pretty good match. Oh, because and- she is smitten kitten the moment she meets him. Oh, she is just god, like, <laughs> oh my god. And so they start planning their wedding pretty soon after. But spoiler alert, it didn't, and then it didn't go through. Uh, Boo Thang decided to get caught up in a duel. Um, and duels were made illegal in France in the 1620s, and they were punishable by death, straight up. So if you didn't survive the duel, you got killed <laughs> you anyway. You could get executed. For... Did, you like, have... Did you ever watch Outlander? No, and I know I... I'm I'm going to get shamed for this. It's fine. It's fine. It... <laughs> because of Outlander, I knew that duels were illegal. In France, whenever I I'm was so glad this. that they did this for you. Yes, yes, I'm so glad <laughs> that they thought of me. <laughs> so Alexander runs away to Portugal, where he dies just a few years later. Yeah. So, that, so imagine I, what things would have been like if, like, he would have stuck around. Because it seems like she was actually in love with this one. So, like, Her yeah, maybe if maybe if she was actually married a man that she loved maybe she yeah things would be different i don't want to give any more spoilers away (laughs) but this was this was a scare for the family because Mm -hmm. since alex had been so in love with her he didn't care that she didn't have a dowry because you know how dad dad is in the relationship with this other woman yeah so he's paying for her to live a top-notch, top-of-society life. But he's also still having to send home money to his actual wife and maintain the palace that they own together. So he's dipped into his his daughter's dowries. And, I Ugh. mean, Rip. I mean, Franny, Franny's got no dowry. 
now that this guy that agreed to marry her without a dowry is gone, it's um, it's a little, it's a, it's a little tricky time. A little, a little, little tricky time. Luckily, another dude falls for Francois like legit <laughs> the next day. And, like, we're not joking. Like, literally the next day, she convinces somebody else to marry her. And so, you know, who needs the loads of money when you're beautiful, smart, and funny, you know? Like, you can find right? somebody with money. That's giving me Bridgerton vibes. Yeah, it is. So, enter a guy named Louis-Henri de Pardeillon. Nailed it. De Gondrin. Double nailed it. Yes. Oh, my God. so good at this. <laughs> We're just going to call this guy Louis Henry because there are a hundred Louis in this story yeah. and um, all the other names are too hard for us to say. <laughs> I like the way that you think here. Yes. <laughs> so she literally met him the day after her fiance fled the country. Like Louis Henry's cousin had been killed in the duel. So like mm-hmm. he went to visit her to be like, hey, this really sucks. Uh, I, I can totally relate. relate. I'm also affected yeah. by this. Yeah. But then they just fell in love. Like he fell head over heels with her. And then they married a week later. A week. <laughs> One week. A week. So, okay. I have opinions. Um, <laughs> so why why is she in such a rush? Like what? Maybe she she's 23. Maybe she's like, I'm getting older now, which now we wouldn't con- would consider 23 a fresh out of the womb baby. Like you were still a fetus. Yeah, but back in the day, you were married at 14. <laughs> her sister, who like followed the same trajectory as her at court, had been married with children by the time she was 23. So maybe she was comparing mm-hmm. herself to her sister. Also, when you're married, you get a little bit more autonomy. You can go to the salons without a chaperone. You can order the clothes that you actually like. Like, you just get this level of autonomy that you don't whenever you're an unmarried girl. But also, maybe she was just like, fuck it. This guy seems fine. And he doesn't care that I don't have a dowry. Like, fuck it. Let's get married. Yeah, fuck it, yeah. There is one theory, though, that I want to discuss with you, Nathan. Their first child was born exactly, like almost to the day, nine months after their wedding. Ah, so maybe she thought she was pregnant, so she was like, we gotta do this now. Because she was actually in love with Alex, maybe, but maybe somehow she knew that she was already a month pregnant or something from Alex, and she was just like, I just need to make a guy fall in love with me. And so that's why that's she married. That's very plausible. I mean, but at the same point, couldn't she get away with it and be like, well, they aren't supposed to have sex before they got married. Right. Yeah, different standards for men and women. Yeah, yeah, they weren't married yet. They were just engaged. Yeah, so. Ah, I like this theory. I, I couldn't find it really anything online to super support my theory. <laughs> That's just, oh, I thought so I you had were it. definitely that bitch. You're Lady Whistledown, basically. I am You're... Lady Whistledown. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wish I could see Katie's face. <laughs> I guess, we're recording this. I can put it on TikTok. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so the wedding didn't go perfectly, and people would later say their wedding was a bad omen. For a not so great marriage. Not so great. Yeah, they were supposed to kneel to take communion at the wedding. And Franny just like totally forgot the pillow they're supposed to kneel on. So they use dog beds. Which to me sounds great. But like I could. (laughs) (laughs) Katie's like, like, and the problem is if it's good enough for Bailey, it's good enough for me. So there were dogs around like, yeah, thumbs up. But no, but for them, it was like he was a bit like, oh, you didn't bring this. And she's like, let's make it work. And it was kind of, yeah, viewed as a bad omen. But they were married. Like, yes. So her husband is now the Marquis de Montespan. And so now she is Madame de Montespan. Yay. Yay. So Louis Henri's family, they're of 
nobility, but they're not rich, bitch. Like, not Mm-mm. super duper rich. In fact, there's a story that we just do not have the time to go in fully. Don't. Don't. Cliff Notes, TLDR, is that Louis Henri's uncle had been involved in a scandal, and now basically his whole family's not welcome at court. So now being in court is how nobility really made money at the time. I mean, that was like, for for Franny, that's the only thing on her resume. That is her only skill set is being a lady in wedding, waiting, being a courtier. So like, if it's like, sh- she needs to keep that mm-hmm. position to make money because they don't really have any. And she doesn't have any and he doesn't have any. Yeah. Yep. About nine months after their wedding, almost to the day, uh, her, her first daughter, Christine, was born and boom, she's right back in court. Yo, when we say right back, right back at court like way too fast in my opinion she even got claps from katie on that one yeah well uh, i think she i think one she had fomo and yeah, two for sure i think she was probably feeling cooped up living with her husband's family um because she's been at court the last few years yeah she was like the little shining star at court too so she was the diamond bridgerton references anyway <laughs> So we haven't been watching that at all. She needed (laughs) to make money. Yes. She went after her daughter was born. She went back to court and performed in a ballet two weeks after her daughter was born. How? Wow. I have never birthed a child. So, but, but from what I hear, two weeks is fast. (laughs) Like that is, that's not a whole... Because also you have to train to perform that ballet. Like, so did she like just what? Did she have no downtime? I, I have so many questions that the internet could not tell me. <laughs> right. So the ballet that she was in was meant to showcase the king's current official mistress. I mm-hmm. am going to butcher the fuck out of this name. Um, her name was Louis de la Valayer. <laughs> <laughs> From here on, let's just let's just call her Louise. Yeah, I think she's the only Louise in the story. That let's just call here her Louise. It. Yeah, I'm here for yeah. it. So she had been the official mistress uh, since like 1661, and so it's like what 1663 right now. So she's yeah, been so like at it for a two or minute. three years. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, and by the way, uh, King Louis, of course, is married, um, and he's married to Maria Teresa of Spain since right? 1660. So this has been going on for a hot minute. Yeah. If there's one thing you may already know about Louis the Fourteenth of France before coming into this episode, what you probably know is that this guy fucked. Yeah, a lot. This guy fucked and this guy fucked often. Yeah, he had lots of mistresses. Like, it was mm-hmm. insane how many he had. We've already kind of mentioned his, I guess, brother-in-law, uh, Charles the Second. Of England, mm. but they they kind of remind me of each other a little bit, mm-hmm. like because they both had a shitload of mistresses, and they both like Louis the Fourteenth was called the Sun King during his reign, so he was fairly popular. And the same with Charles the Second; he brought Christmas back to England, so he was popular. So anyway, that's yeah, and they both fucked, and they, and they both, both fucked. fucked. Yes, <laughs> side quest. Anyway, bring it on back. So, fun fact of Louis the Fourteenth: he was only 5'3", so he's a little baby sun king. He's a little baby sun king. <laughs> <laughs> so, he actually, he actually brought high heels into fashion for men, which I am here for. I love it. So, if Madame de Montespan had any interest in the king at this point, we just don't know about it. But the current official mistress, you know, Louis, or Lu- cannot, Louise. I cannot with these <laughs> names today. Uh, <laughs> Louise La Velia. Should we just call her LLV? LLV. So LLV, LLV is the exact opposite of Franny. So mm. LLV, not really noted as such a great beauty. She's yeah. not really ambitious. She's very conflicted about being a mistress because she didn't believe in adultery. So yeah, complete opposite of Franny. Yeah, not not we're not going to see any of these problems with Madame de Montespan. Although she wasn't like romantically on the king's radar yet. The king obviously knew who she was cuz she was like kind of talk of the town or whatever. 
And she worked for his brother, the Duke of Orleans. So he already knew about her and he loved her sense of humor. She was just a lot of fun to be around. Like we said, she she got that from her dad. Her dad was the same way. She kept on top of politics, philosophy. She always had something clever and funny to say. So the king raised her from a lady-in-waiting to the duke's wife to a lady-in-waiting to the queen, Marie Theresa, which was not only just a big like societal move, but also a huge financial move for her as well. Because like being the lady-in-waiting to the duke's wife was like an internship. Like it didn't really pay. Yeah. So now being a lady-in-waiting to the queen... It has to pay because you are expected to always be in the prettiest dresses, the prettiest hair. Like you're expected to be the it girl, basically. Yeah. So one example of her sense of humor, she used to tease the royal brothers that her family was older and that her family was just (laughs) a little more influential. So I don't know. Maybe I should be sitting on the throne. So maybe I should be king. I don't know. Just food for thought. Mull it over. Yeah. (laughs) Other people making that joke would have been kicked out of court real quick. But because she was so funny and charming, and I'm sure damn titties didn't hurt. Damn titties didn't hurt. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) They were just like, oh, Madame de Montespan, you're so cute. And then just like, yeah. She got away with whatever she wanted. In 1665, she had another baby with her husband, uh, this time a son named Louis, which is going to be a trend. But after getting pregnant, after she got pregnant with her second child with her husband, I don't, like, we just don't see a whole lot of evidence that her husband paid any attention to her. Yeah. Yeah, about that. Uh, There was definitely a rift in the relationship. Yeah, He was never with his wife. They didn't really keep in touch. But you could always find Louis Henri at the gambling table, at the blackjack table. Dude loved to gamble, like to the point that he almost ruined his family. I mean, that could be part of the reason they had a rift. Too. Exactly, exactly. I read one story about how he pawned a bunch of her jewelry while she was pregnant with their second child. She was furious, but it was like to keep himself because back then they had this thing called debtor prison. And if you, you know, if you were in debt and you couldn't pay it, you'd go to prison. And he did that to keep himself out of prison. And she was furious, but like, what could she do? She couldn't. Yeah. She couldn't, yeah. And so it just really sucks. Do better, Omri. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah he seems kind of like an a hole, like a deadbeat it, husband. It just ends up putting so much pressure on her because she is trying so hard at court not to let anybody know about their financial issues. Yeah, um, she just got her promotion. Yes. She's now the lady in waiting to the queen. Like, the lady in waiting to the queen are supposed to be the bougiest. The bougiest. She's supposed to have the latest fashion, the latest accessories, mm-hmm. the latest mm-hmm. everything. So this fucking sounds stressful. How can you do that if your husband is pawning your jewelry to not go to jail? You know, like, Ugh. that sounds horrible. I think it's around around this time of her second child that she got in her head. Like, yeah. I mean, the king had his wife and he had an official mistress, but he had other women that he fucked around with and gave gifts to. So I honestly think that it was around this time that she's like, huh, if the king paid attention to me, I could get a new dress here and there. I could get some gifts. Mm-hmm. Just like, it sounds like she was carrying her entire family, like, because her dad had been a fuck off and, like, you know, left his mom, her mom, and left them with financial issues. And now she's married to this husband who's also not bringing in any cash. I bet it's a fucking, that's a lot of pressure you know yeah for sure she's just thinking if i could just lighten this fucking load maybe i can just give the king a little handsy and then i get it (laughs) i i get a dress i can wear this season or something you know yeah sounds like a good deal to me yeah yeah. (laughs) so yes the king had his wife and official mistress but he had other girlfriends too and 
right. they only lasted a couple months here and there. So I don't think she had in her head to oust the current official mistress or ma présentrite. Oh, you said that so pretty. Did you practice? No, I absolutely did not. <laughs> <laughs> so I think at this point, she's just like, I need a win. I need some money. I need a new dress. Let's go give a handsy to the king. Yes, exactly. Handsy to the king. You know, good career path. So now, now Franny was raised religious and she's married. Um, and Louis' mistresses weren't ever married women. Mm-mm. So you don't Mm-mm. sleep with another man's wife. I mean, that's just typical bro code. That it's just bro the, code. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the king even went by that. Yeah. So I think she had a bit of a crisis of faith at this point in her life. Because there are some records that indicate that she wrote to her husband before anything happened with the king. Being like, I'm not sure I want to work at court anymore. This is a lot. Come get your girl. I want to go home. And basically, well, like, so I've read a couple of different things. I couldn't figure out exactly what Louis Henri did for his day job. I read one thing that he tried to be like, a general, I read one thing that he tried to be a lawyer, but it sounds like whatever he was doing, it wasn't really make making enough money to keep up with his gambling habits. So he writes back being like, no, you need to stay put. Uh, it'd be the ruin of our family if you left. I don't think she ever planned to be the breadwinner for no. the entire family. She stayed at court. And I think that's when she decided. She's like, I see one very clear option of how I support myself and support my family and my children, you know? Yep, and that's a, that's a handsy to the king. It's a handsy to the king. And that's what she set her sights on because we all need goals. Yes. And yes. blowjobs. jobs. Okay. <laughs> 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 she, she was in the rare position that both the queen and the official mistress considered her her friend her, her, You're right. her friend yes yeah so everyone was like we love her she's the best new thing and the fact that these two women didn't talk to each other made them blind to that they were both confiding in madame de Montes fan they were the being time. like double played or whatever yeah and so they they were telling her all about what the king likes what he doesn't like and yet again, here she is. She's taking notes, taking yeah. all dim notes with dim titties. So the official mistress, Louise, L-O-V, she had been the mistress for like six or seven years. And the king still loved her. But at this point, he wasn't necessarily in love with her anymore. Mm-hmm. So she confided into Montespan. And I kind of hate this. I kind of hate this part of the story. She's like, you have so much confidence. You were so funny. Everyone likes being around you. You know, I've got these couple of dinners planned with the king. Maybe if you come with me and like act as our comedic relief, like maybe then like we just get him in a good mood and then I go to bed with him. And Montespan obviously is like, yeah, of course, I'll be your fluffer. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. And she totally does it and llv was like omg you down with llv Um, down with llv yeah you know me (laughs) this is working because now the king is super eager to spend time with me you know but sadly for louise it was not to spend time with her uh the king actually started growing fond of franny Yeah. yeah yeah this is awkward i hate that madame de montespan played louise like that Yes. Like, it seems like Louise was a very sweet person, albeit maybe not very cunning. You know what I mean? Maybe not yeah. very, I don't want to say smart, because I do think she was a smart person, but just not very, she didn't know how to play the game. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And Franny knew how to play the game. She Franny was, knew how to play the game, yeah. She knew what she was doing. She saw the king was falling out of love with her. So she played into this friendship hard. Like, she yeah. used it to her advantage. Can you imagine, like, the public humiliation? Because it seems like everyone at court knew what Madame de Montespan was doing, except for LLV. Everyone knew, oh, she's playing you, she's pretending to be your friend so she can get to the king, 
except for the very trusting Luis. Like, yeah, poor girl was not meant for the French court at all. She really wasn't. She was not. Oh, I bless her heart. So fast forward a few months. <laughs> And Luis is big and preggers, and the mm-hmm. king hasn't as much looked at her in months, which asshole. Um, so back then, they believed that sleeping with a pregnant woman could make her lose the baby. Uh, now we know that's not truth, but also it gave it gave the king an excuse to not look at her. Yeah, you know, yeah. So anyway. the court is moving to Flanders for, you know, war dicking reasons. Um, and we're not going to go into it like we already said. <laughs> yeah. And the king told Louise to stay behind in Paris uh, because she she's like big and preggers. And yeah. it's just better for the baby's health if you just chill. You know, she's you not into like horseback riding <laughs> yeah. while pregnant like yeah. some of our queens. <laughs> but she knew it was really... Because he's no longer in love with her. And she's right. getting the proverbial boot. Um, Basically, he, yeah. He just wanted to get away from her. And he wanted to start an affair with our lovely Madame de Montespan. So all of it was true. Lu- Luis came to Flanders anyway. Even though the king had been like, don't do it. She was like, oh, he'll think it's so much fun. I'm going to surprise him there. And he did not think it was so much fun. He uh- did not want her there. And the two of them got in this huge fight in front of the whole court, which my heart just sings for this poor lady. Like, she's already being disrespected. Everyone at court knows that he doesn't want her anymore. And now she's big and pregnant, and he yells at her in front of everybody. Uh. Franny is sitting there after the whole altercation happens. She, like turns and just very loudly to the whole court is like, I would never want to be the king's mistress. This is such a stressful situation. Who would ever want to put themselves in this situation? Being the king's mistress must suck balls. (laughs) The lady doth protest too much. (laughs) We get it. You kind of secretly want to be the king's mistress. Okay. Okay. Take yeah. several seats. Well, and also everyone knew that the king was like in love with her already at this point. Yeah. So anyway, it was here in Flanders that their affair all started officially. Uh, mm-hmm. The story goes that Madame de Montespan was in the bath and the king decides to dress up like a guard and he's just looking around for her. Then he just like walks right on into the room that she's bathing in, which kind of weird. It's weird. <laughs> so I'm just when, a guard poking into the bathrooms. What? Yeah, right. And when he walked in, she was just like getting out of the tub, so she had like a towel wrapped around her. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She freaked the fuck out and started to scream. But then she realizes, oh, this is five oh. foot three Louis. Oh. oh, it's little Louis, little whoa, Louis. Whoa. <laughs> so she just lets the towel drop to the ground and then he's like damn titties and that's when <laughs> some of this started <laughs> happening <laughs> <laughs> and that seems like a good place let's take a little break let's top off our drinks and we'll be back And we're back. So they fucked. <laughs> so they fucked. And they fucked a lot. And they yes. fucked often. <laughs> yes. Three, three times a day. Every day. Penis and vagina intercoursal activities. Did you say intercoursal? Yes. Is that is that like an actual? It is now. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so like he would seriously uh, come into her rooms and... And even if she'd still have other people in the room, he'd just, like, start taking off her clothes in front of everybody. Like, imagine oh. being the poor maid and just being like, ah. I know. <laughs> so, a few months later, they head back to Paris. And it was pretty much, like, an open secret at this point that Franny is the new chick. Yes. But... The official mistress, I mean, LLV was still at court. 
And there was like, oh, to make someone the mistress on um, <laughs> or what, the mistress on <laughs> the, um, the official mistress. <laughs> There was paperwork. There was a whole lot of shit. So he wasn't convinced just yet that she was going to have staying power. So he didn't give her this role. And he also didn't want to put LLV into any more embarrassment that she had already had. You know what I mean? Yeah. But what he did next was so mean to LLV. Like, I don't know if he meant to or not, but we're going to go through it. First, he gave Franny rooms that were conjoined to LLV's room. So to everyone else, it looked like he was just going to visit his official mistress. But then he just like, just passing through. As he goes and joins Franny. Yeah. Yeah. That must have been so like, oh, are you here to visit me? No, I'm just passing through. Oh. Oh, that hurts my heart. I don't love that. I do not love that journey for them. So, also in public, he made it look like Montespan was now LLV's, like, lady-in-waiting. But she never worked for Mm -mm. Louise. And Mm -mm. everyone actually in court knew that she was only there as a cover-up. And it was just a huge slap in the face to Louise. Another big thing why they couldn't like um, openly acknowledge Franny as his official mistress, like we said earlier, she was married. His mistresses weren't usually married. And it's a huge scandal to have a married woman acting as your official mistress. It made me think of, um, oh God, who were we talking about? We've talked about several mistresses that were married. This was this this predated a lot of those. And it was just like, what do I do with this? Like, he couldn't really give her the official title. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The king could change that by acknowledging her. Or if they had children together, the king could also change that by acknowledging their children. The king could change the roles, but he was hesitant at first to be like, where does this go? You know? Yeah. So after a year or so of this... Luis was like, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> and the king was like, cool, 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 cool. Makes sense. Uh, so he I'm ends not, up, I can't believe it took her a year. Right? But he ended up making her a duchess, gave her an income. So their children had titles and shit. And she's like, LLV's like, peace out. I'm going to a convent. Bye. And the king was like, peace out. Love you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can you imagine living in that humiliation for like a year? Yeah, right. I mean, at least Louis didn't like make his ex boo thing sleeping on sleep on the streets and shit. Like he at least took care of them. He did take care of all his mistresses. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Because he knew the power of the pussy. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> so let's uh, circle back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but Circling we'll circle back. back to Versailles for a minute, shall oh, we? Oh, we oui, oui. So Louis the Fourteenth first visited this cute little hunting lodge when he was a sweet baby king. Uh, yeah. And he was being sent out of Paris during the smallpox outbreak. So... Louis's life as a child was tumultuous. And ever since he was young, he was kind of over all of this bullshit court life. Right. And he slowly grew to think that the nobility had too much power and had too much say, which he's not really wrong on that one. He he ain't wrong. Nathan, have you been to Versailles? No. It is the fanciest fucking place that I have ever been in in my life. And I have been... To a number of fancy places. Oh, uh, she bougie. Mm, Where's her crown? Mm. But no, to think that it was when he first went there, a small hunting lodge. Like, <laughs> it's just it's just really interesting to think about. Oversimplification, but go on this journey with us just for a little bit. So slowly over time, he started to expand on this cute little hunting lodge. Cute uh, little hunting lodge. Really funny on how to describe Versailles. But if you don't, if you don't know what Versailles looks like, we'll wait for you. Google it. Google it. 
And we're back. So And we're back. It's bougie as fuck. Y'all. Yeah. That's a pretty big <laughs> hunting lodge, isn't it? It's a very a very fancy hunting lodge indeed. So that's because this building it it was over the top of the palace. So this was a huge passion project for Louis. Mm-hmm. And subsequently a passion project for Madame de Montespan. Yeah. Uh, they both wanted to expand Versailles. So she actually even designed one of the fountains up there. Super awesome. So they're building this relationship on architecture and dick. Lots of dick. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, I, I love the story about her getting into Versailles, like the designing of Versailles. And just because he kind of seemed like on his own island about like, I want to move the court to Versailles and everyone else was like, why would you want to move the court to Versailles? We're all here. And she seems to be one of the first people that really embraced that with him. Mm -hmm. So I think that really spoke to him. Yeah. So I think that's a recurring theme in any side hustle we talk about. It's always more than just sex that comes down to it. Right. Because remember, right. kings don't usually marry for love. It's very rare that we get a love match whenever we're finding these relationships. So exactly. he basically yeah. just married his wife because he needed to strengthen the alliance with Spain. Oh, that's Hashtag so romance. Right. So romantic. So... But it's human to fall in love, you know? Mm-hmm. And so you you couldn't help that he would still... You still have that part of your life where you're going to fall in love. That is sort of the role that Franny was filling for him, you know? And so, but like, I really do believe that they were like actually falling in love. Yes, Madame de Montespan wanted power. She wanted security. And she wanted all the things that came with being the royal mistress. But... I I do think that they were actually very, very, very much in love. Do you know what I mean? Agreed. Agreed. So slowly she starts being recognized as the official mistress. And that comes with what she's been wanting. The steady income mm-hmm. comes with the staff. She's got a room at every palace, a literal seat at the table. Before we end this episode, let's check in on Mr. de Montespan. Because Louis Henri, if he had any idea this was shit going down, he was playing dumb about it. Like for, for a, a while. <laughs> yeah. For a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Like two years. Because previously, if the king had a mistress that got pregnant, it was just sort of like, okay. Like, I'll just give them a trust fund. It's fine. But she was his first mistress that was married. So they took special precaution not to get pregnant. In a time where there wasn't birth control. So I have to imagine this was really unsexy means to not get pregnant. (laughs) When she finally does, the husband comes out of the woodwork being like, what? So she was so anxious about this. She apparently got really sick from it. Mm-hmm. She also started a new fashion trend of really flowy dresses that would hide oh, her preggers belly. Yeah. <laughs> but once she couldn't hide it anymore, here comes Louis Henri. He storms up to the palace in Paris. And when Franny finds out, she's physically sick out of anxiety from this. Oh, I could imagine. And then Louis is like, okay, well, that's enough of that. And then he has Louis Henri thrown in prison and then exiled to never (laughs) set foot in Paris again. Oh my God. Yeah. He's, but he's showing, he's showing Franny that like, Hey, I got you. Like, I'm not going to let this stress you out i'm not gonna let this um harm our child together or whatever yeah and louis Henri ended up like stepping foot back in paris uh but it doesn't yeah. seem to at this point have bothered madame de montespan at all right i think that's a good place to leave her she's got the king wrapped around her finger and i think next episode we'll get into the implications of that all. The scandal. All right. You guys have a great rest of your day, and we'll talk to you in about a week or so. Cheers, Cheers. bitches. Cheers.